And welcome everybody to the sixth edition of the Deserve to Win podcast. As always, I'm your host, Eric J. Troutman, the czar of the TCPA, really the czar of just about everything these days. Uh, really glad that you're here, coming at you, of course, from our beautiful podcast studio in Santa Ana. Really excited to be here, and we've got a fantastic special show for you today. First, our guest, Josh Swaggart. For those of you know who don't know this guy, you're going to love this backstory. Josh is actually the person who I had my very first TCPA class action against. If it wasn't for Josh... I would have never gotten into the TCPA. You're going to hear the entire backstory during our interview. This is fantastic stuff. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to Josh. I mean, he's opposing counsel, but I mean, he is the closest thing I would say to a friend uh, that I have on the plaintiff's bar. I actually really like the guy. He's a very genuine fellow. I think you're going to get that sense when you talk to him or when we talk to him. Uh, but before we get there, of course, let's introduce our fantastic TCPA world. Talking about friends. These are my real friends. Uh, let's start with you, PJ. I am the wizard of TCPA world, non-legal consultant. I own Direct Marketing Wizard. It's a direct mail house that's growing rapidly in uh, the Southern California area. And I also have a lot of call center experience and run a few call centers. I love that introduction, man. Wizard, you are a wizard. And I love the way you just, you just, I was very smooth. I was very smooth <laughs> today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and to my right, wearing a velvet smoking jacket uh, is Pooja. Hi. Hi. Uh, so for the first time ever, I'm going to introduce myself oh. as Pooja J. Amin, Queenie, co-founder of the Troutman Firm. That's right. This is brand new. You now are no longer at Digital Thrive, where previously you had been. You are now actually employed by, I guess, me, oh, which no. is really Here we weird. Go again. Um, <laughs> geez, Pooja, I hadn't thought of it until this, just this moment. Well, I mean... You work for me now. This really opens up a lot of possibilities. Alongside you. But what's interesting is last time I worked for you, um, Josh uh, came out with the Marks decision. <clears throat> that is but, right. I think we're going to have to talk about the yeah, Marks absolutely. decision when we get him on. Uh, but in all seriousness, it is fantastic to have Pooja on. You are calling yourself a co-founder. I think that's perfectly appropriate because, truthfully, if it wasn't for Pooja, there wouldn't be a Troutman firm. She's helped from day one, as has PJ, actually. Both of these, as I said in the first episode... You know, incredibly grateful to both of them for giving me the push, the encouragement, the resources, the the backing um, to, to be able to do and, and be where we are. So thank you. It really is an honor and a privilege to have you riding alongside, Pooja. I'm really glad that you're here. Uh, it's great to have a queenie uh, as my right hand again. It's fantastic stuff. Uh, okay, but let's throw it over to, uh, you know, my other good, wonderful friends and pals. We'll start with, you know, it's so interesting because usually, Dame, you're like so red, but in this light today, it's like you're almost have the same color as, as the Baroness, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, right here? Yeah. <laughs> but, but who are you? What are you doing here? Okay, I'm Tori Gidry, a.k.a. the Dame. I am an associate attorney at Troutman Firm. And just fantastic all and the way fantastic. around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and last but not least, Ms. Baroness. Hi, guys. My name is Brittany Andres. I am the Mar Baroness of the TCPA world, and I'm an associate attorney at the Troutman Firm. Love having all these wonderful people, fantastic lawyers at my side. Uh, all right, so a bit of a special episode today. As you know, the Troutman Firm, I'm not going to say specializes because we're not allowed to use that word, uh, <laughs> but we do a whole lot of TCPA, as I think you folks know. Uh, but we are definitely pivoting and keeping a very close eye on the California Invasion of Privacy Act. Uh, and that is why we're bringing Josh Swagger onto the show today. You're going you're gonna to hear all about him uh, and, and what his practice is. Uh, but the reason that we're interested in the California Invasion of Privacy Act is, look, let me just say it, right? I am a big game hunter. I'm in this to defend the biggest class actions that exist in the world. The TCPA has generated probably the biggest cases that have ever, ever existed in the United States uh, judicial system, at least from a financial standpoint. Uh, they are incredibly complex cases. They're almost always in federal court. Only a tiny percentage of lawyers ever dare to step foot in federal court. Another tiny percentage ever dare to handle a class action. We live and breathe and do nothing but complex uh, federal court class litigation uh, at the highest stakes, billions of dollars on the line. And that's what we've built a team for. What is fascinating is that the California Invasion of Privacy Act is the only statute in the nation, well, the other wiretapping statutes as well, we're going to talk about those, that kind of even comes close to the complexity and the difficulty and ultimately the stakes that the TCPA offers. And unsurprisingly, all the big, big sharks that have made millions of dollars in the TCPA side, again, on the plaintiff side, are pivoting and looking at the SIPA now. And of course, when the bad guys start going over there, when the villains are headed there, you know, you expect the heroes to show up too. So we're really <laughs> taking a really close look at SIPA. 
uh, and I want to start sharing some information. Now, look, we've talked in the, in the previous podcast about the Javier decision. We're not going to spend too much time talking about Javier, but it really is kind of the dark cloud that that's you know hanging over all of our heads right now. In Javier, of course, the, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal determined that using Active Prospect's trusted form, which is a web session replay program that's used to help people to capture consent, constitutes wiretapping under the SIPA. And that means, as Tori's gonna tell us here in a second, that every single visit to a website could cost $5,000. That is the private right of action that's enabled under SIPA. It kind of makes the TCPA's $500 violation seem small. And when you think about the number of people that are visiting a website, these damages can really be incredibly high. So this is incredibly high stakes poker. And that's why, of course, you know, a, a powerful litigation shop like the Trotman Firm is built for. That's exactly why we exist and we're looking for the challenge. But let's start talking through the current case law here post Javier. Um, why don't we start with you, Pujo? We can just start laying a little groundwork and then we can move around and talk about some developments. Do you want me to talk about SIPA or do you want me to just talk about yeah, we're talking about SIPA. Oh, that, that, okay. Did, did you like, not hear like the last like <laughs> ten minutes we're talking about SIPA? Well, because you just did a breakdown of SIPA, so I was wondering what you were wanting me to talk about. But anyway, so what I wanted to add with Eric's breakdown of uh, SIPA was, in addition to the web session replays, the a focus right now is also on chat box communications, right? So you have web session replays, you have chat box communications, and additionally you have uh, just business owners using uh, uh, consumers' interaction, right? Their keystrokes, gathering PIA to give a better consumer experience, right? So you take a web page like Petco, for instance, right? And, uh, Petco. Right, and, and you, and, you know, you're you're on the website. You're a consumer who's searching for a uh, certain type of dog food, right? You have a big dog, so then you know Petco wants to display um, products that will be available for your big dog, for instance, right? They're using that information not necessarily to use it against you or gather data on you to resell it, but really just to give you a better experience, so you feel like you're a part of that website. Then when you Alter- later go onto the website again, that information saved, right? Or it's available to you at least. Uh, so the argument goes, at least on the defense side, is that they're really just using it to provide you with the services that you're looking for. Um, but what's happening now, plaintiff's attorneys, you know, they're, they're using these wiretapping um, statutes to say that, that that is in violation of wiretapping. You're wiretapping the consumer's preferences without consent. Uh, regardless, and it's, you know, in a court like Pennsylvania, which we'll get to here in a little bit, whether uh, the, whether the business owner obtained consent via its, its privacy policy is up for debate in a lot of state courts right now. So let's let's get a little more foundational here, because I feel like we, we skipped to the end of something without covering the beginning, which is what are the acts that are actually going to be constituting wiretapping? Now, I gave everybody one. Right, which is web session uh, replay technology, where there's a, a Java pixel sitting on a website and essentially recording um, the movements on that website. When the consumer is on the website, that is being recorded. Uh, and then in the case of trusted form, a visual rendering is being prepared with the data coordinates that are being recorded as part of that web session. That's one example of something that a court, at least in the Ninth Circuit, has found can constitute wiretapping and again it, it it's worth breaking down because when you think of wiretapping like what internet right you're thinking of like somebody going out taking a pair of pliers taking you know one of those little nodes and sticking it into a wire yeah, somewhere the yeah up in the, up in the <laughs> up in the telephone lines and like running it down like listening in right but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about recording events that are taking place on websites. Uh, and of course, in the context of web session recording, again, it doesn't really meet the statutory definition in my opinion. You can read my breakdown on TCPA world of the Javier decision as to why I think that is. Uh, but you can understand conceptually, at least, the idea is that something that is being transmitted over a wire, specifically an internet session, right? Uh, back and forth between servers on the one hand and a consumer on the other, passing information back and forth, if you're recording that, that can be viewed as wiretapping. Now, critically, at least in California, if you are recording and doing your own analytics, that is not going to be viewed as wiretapping because in California, there is the direct party exception, essentially, that says you can record and do analytics on your own website, on your own website yourself. Now, in Javier, of course, the issue was that 
uh, uh, Assurance, which was the defendant in that case, wasn't recording itself. It was using Active Prospect, the third party. And so the concept was that Active Prospect was the wire tapper and that Assurance wasn't recording itself. It was aiding and abetting, that's literally the theory, aiding and abetting Active Prospect, the third party, to do the wire tapping. So you started talking about chat box, mm -hmm. which I really want to talk about because we're seeing a huge number of new filings in the chat box setting. The concept, of course, being that if a third party is providing that chat box technology, even if it's on your website, right, as you can imagine, that's being viewed, if it's not disclosed, mm -hmm. potentially as wiretapping because the communication over the wire, right, the back and forth communication over the wire between the consumer and the servers is being recorded by this third party and again, the theory at least is that that's wiretapping. And I gotta tell you, that might have legs. Yeah, especially when you look at it where the third party isn't the direct recipient of that information, right? They are a third party. So, you know, it's really interesting. Um, and the chat boxes are being utilized across so many different verticals, right? Like you're booking your airlines, you want faster, you want to complain, et cetera. Um, they're a very useful tool for folks who don't want to sit on the phone all day long. Yeah, we're seeing like what dozens of these cases oh, yeah. now. I mean, it, it's it is really kind of um, it's kind of rampant out there. And and you you're right. What you teed up was it all comes down to consent, um, and that was what the Javier Court really kind of emphasized. If you're obtaining the prior express consent, then you can wiretap all you want, but you can't record the consent, right? You have to get the consent before you can record. And the mistake that they made in Javier was that the Act of Prospect Trusted form program was running at the time that the terms and conditions were accepted that included the permission to wiretap and because it wasn't obtained until um, and because the consent wasn't obtained before the recording started you know you recorded me giving you permission to record me and that's what they sued for it's crazy it's ridiculous but that is the law um, so yeah, in the chat box setting, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, in the chat box settings, like when I'm looking at it, depending on how the courts are coming out with how to capture consent, it seems easy enough to capture that consent, right? Um, it's similar to the Javier case, just have a pop up. So I can imagine, you know, the chat box pops up, but right before that, the consent disclosure pops up. Got accept it, and then you you can go ahead and yeah. How typing, simple right? is that? Right? It seems so simple to me, but again, I don't know how the courts, like in California, perhaps that'd be okay. But there's other wiretapping. Uh, state laws out there that are still evaluating what is proper consent in these wiretapping cases. Yeah, so keep an eye on chat boxes. If you're using a chat box on your uh, website, keep in mind you might be at risk. And again, pretty easy ways to protect against this, but give us a call. We can kind of talk it through. And if you're a chat box platform as well, because yeah. those guys are getting pulled in, right? The third parties are getting pulled into these lawsuits yeah. as well. We love you, Aru. I know. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so look, we, now we've gone a little, a little esoteric. I want to get a little more basic. Most folks know the California Invasion of Privacy Act as the anti- uh, call recording statute, and that's a different section. Okay, so the wiretapping provision is 631 of the California Penal Code, and as the name suggests, a uh, violation of this act is actually a crime. It's not just that you owe $5,000 per violation, you could also go to jail for it. So it's something that you definitely want to pay attention to. So uh, Penal Code Section 631 is, of course, the wiretapping statute. Penal Code Section 632 at sequential, particularly 632.5, looks at the recording of confidential communications. And this is California's famous two-party mm -hmm. recording consent statute. And Tori, why don't you give us a little background on that? Okay. Well, I think y'all basically covered it in y'all covering cases, but... This just requires that both parties consent to the recording, and if this is violated, then you end up with a $5,000 fine per violation. And it's just a criminal statute that's only 2500 but you're also facing jail time. I believe it's a year, um, but don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not exactly remember the amount of... Time. Yeah, so I mean, so, so in California, the bottom line is, right, if you're on a phone call, yeah. no one can record you. Yep. And, and if they do, they have to give you the famous disclosure of this mm -hmm. call may be recorded for quality assurance or for whatever reason it's being recorded for. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, I mean, that's a pretty, very significant violation of the law. Yeah, and especially when it's 5,000 per violation. I mean, that adds up pretty quickly to where you're looking at, you know, extreme, extreme penalties for, you know, 
these cases. Yeah, and the nice thing, though, about at least 632 is that everybody knows about this, yeah. right? California is famous for its two-party uh, consent statute. Uh, in fact, there's a, case, a California Supreme Court case called Kearney back in 2006, a really fascinating case. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you all to read it. Um, and what happened was there was a company... I want to say it was Deloitte, but maybe not. It was a company in Georgia, though, I forget the name of, of the defendant in that case, um, was recording an interaction, you know, typical transaction with a consumer, nothing, you know, surreptitious, nothing sneaky, but they didn't disclose that the call was being recorded. Georgia, at least at the time, and it might still be, was a one-party consent state, meaning just one of the two mm -hmm. parties had to consent to the recording to make it legal. Um, the California consumer sued the Georgia company in California for a violation of the California Act. And the defendant, as you would expect them to say, was like, wait a second, we did the recording in Georgia. It is perfectly legal for us to do that. And the California Supreme Court said, I don't care. It's not legal here in California. And the consumer was in California and the consumer has the right to sue. And they did something though that I have never seen before or since, uh, which is the California Supreme Court said, we're giving everybody in the nation six months warning. The Supreme Court of California said this. We're not going to enforce it against you, defendant, because, you know, you're in Georgia and you're innocent. You didn't know. We're going to give you a mulligan, and we're going to warn everybody. You all got six months, okay? But listen up. This is the Supreme Court of California talking. We've got a bullhorn. If you call into California, you have to have two-party consent period, and we're not going to hear any more whining that we didn't know after six months. Um, I've never heard of a case doing that before, uh, and so that should tell you kind of the level of, of danger that the California Invasion of Privacy Act actually has, where uh, the Supreme Court of California actually gave everyone a warning. Now, unfortunately, that was in the context of phone calls. No one got a warning in the context of wiretapping, now did we? Um, you know, it would, would have been nice if the Ninth Circuit said, Warning, you all have six months to get your practices in line here. They didn't do that. So I guess I'm the guy saying, warning, you have to do this right away. I like to flail my arms. Like, warning, Especially warning. if your servers are in California. So if the information is being recorded, say, in Texas, the consumer's in Texas, the retailer's in Texas, but your third-party servers are in California, potentially you could be liable under SIPA. So. And, well, and that's the other thing. Right? You start talking about the corollary, and that's why we're pivoting back and forth, mm -hmm. right? You start talking about the corollary between the call recording taking place out of state and now the server wiretap mm -hmm. taking place out of state. You wonder, you wonder. Where the wiretapping occur? Really? Would the California Supreme Court give a six-month notice to people whose servers <laughs> are in the cloud to say, hey, you're wiretapping? It's just—it's very fascinating to me. The location of servers does matter to mm -hmm. this analysis. Uh, according to the definition in 631, the act of wiretapping has to take place in California. Uh, there is now a growing body of law that looks at where does the wiretap take place in the context of of at least web session recording technology. Um, and it's really interesting because the way the courts are analyzing it very, very poorly, frankly, is you know where did the, uh, the signal hit the Let's server, yeah. which is like strange, right? I mean, just we're gonna have to get an expert to say, it, we're, it's all cloud these days, right? So we're, we're, all, we're all in various internet backbones, but we're all gonna be landing in cloud servers. Where are those clouds? And at any point, the cloud resource might be in California for one consumer and then out of it for the next, which on the one hand is great to defeat class certification, you would think. On the other hand, how do you defend your case, right? I mean, it's very challenging. Luckily, the plaintiff has the burden of proof on that issue. Um, okay, let's throw it over to our friend, the Baroness. Next breakdown, by the way, Tori. Baroness, what do you got for us? Another huge, ca another huge SIPA case. Oh, um, yes, yes. Plaintiff sued Meta Poor for meta. a SIPA violation. They, they knew it was coming. I'm about, they had to, yeah. they had to. I'm about to buy some Meta stock, I think. <laughs> they're, they're getting beat up, man. Like, at the time of this recording, they're down in, like, I think, like, the high 80s, you know, down from a high of, like, 360, like, six months ago. So... Mm -hmm. It's getting, look, and I've never been a believer in social media. I don't use social media. I don't believe in social media. But at some point, you have to say the valuations are starting to look pretty good. I mean, their, their P to E ratio is like 10. So some of you are watching this going, what the hell is he talking about? Some of you are like, yeah, that's a good investment. <laughs> uh, okay, go ahead, Britt. Sorry. <laughs> the complaint states an unspecified unspecified amount of damages a trillion dollars like eric and tori <laughs> said it's five thousand dollars per website visit so there's potentially three trillion or Jeez. trillion dollars in damages Meta yes. can afford it yeah, but what's the <laughs> what's the theory here though can we unpackage this a little bit more what, what's the theory like what was uh meta doing specifically that's going to be treated potentially as wiretapping yeah so even uh plaintiff states that even when users don't consent uh meta is or consent to being tracked Meta tracks 
Facebook and Instagram users online activity and communications with external third party websites by injecting JavaScript code onto those websites. Yeah, so what's really interesting, I don't look, I don't know if this is true or not. Okay. I'm just reporting what is in this complaint. It could all just be a fat lie. But what was very interesting is that Meta, I guess, is working with other platforms so that when you are clicking out of, say, Facebook into uh, pulling up an Instagram or a Twitter or something, there's apparently an intermediary page, right? Twitter does not just allow you to stay in if you're in uh, you know, Internet Explorer, which I guess doesn't exist anymore, Chrome, or whatever it is that is your, your browser. When you click out in Meta and Facebook, again, according to the complaint, it forces you to open a different browser, a fake hmm. browser. And that fake browser has a bunch of, I don't know, stuff that's recording what's going on, right? So you think that you're just going from uh, Facebook to Instagram or Facebook to you know wherever people go. I've never mm -hmm. been on Facebook, so I don't know. But however you do it, Facebook to Yahoo, I go to Yahoo. Um, then, but, but you're not. Instead, you're still in the environment where everything you're doing is being recorded. And the allegations, at least, are that the consumer doesn't know that's happening, right? So now you're th seemingly on a totally different website, interacting with a totally different website, and all of your mouse clicks, all of the PII you might be entering, all that's being recorded and theoretically used by Facebook and Meta in a way that, that you didn't know was happening, which, by the way, is another good reason to invest in them. I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, but in, in seriousness, I mean, this is very significant because if it is true, and again, I, I'm not saying it is true because I don't know if it is true, but if it is true, this has happened millions of times, millions of times within the statutory period, and that's what makes this, these cases so interesting because when something is happening millions of times and you've got $5,000 per violation at issue, I mean, you're, you're just, you know, facially... Facially, you're talking about billions on the line, but but you know, and but TCPA cases, you know, we're always dealing with billion dollar cases. What else is new? Uh, but this is something where literally, at the volume that Facebook operates, you could be talking about trillions in damages, trillions. And there's, I'll tell you right now, there's no other statute that that's going to be creating trillions of dollars in damages, other than maybe the TCPA. I remember the uh, the old Dish Network case out of CD Illinois. If you ever go back and actually read the court's, not the court's conclusion on the amount of damages owed, but the court's findings on all the statutory violations, and you add them up, it actually totaled over $1.6 trillion that Dish would have owed if you looked at all the statutory violations that the court found, uh, although it ultimately only awarded judgment for like $160 million, something small. Uh, but this is the only other statute that can create true trillion-dollar liability. It's just absolutely wild. Uh, so that, for the, thanks for that breakdown. Uh, PJ, before we go to our wonderful guest, Josh Swagger, do you have anything? I don't have anything. You have absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> PJ, why do we have you here, man? You're just dead weight, I tell you. Nothing this, uh, this week. Oh, my know. God. I love you so much. You'll never be dead weight. We wouldn't be here without I you. I appreciate it. Uh, and your your mail shop is doing well? Everything's doing great. It's cruising along. Call, Call center. How are you doing with the two-party consent rules? Call center's good. Two-party consent I've been aware of for a long time. Yep. And every state has different. Yep, each state. Yeah. But we're in California, so we got to abide by California. But you have to be mindful of where you're calling in as well. But since we're already a two-party state, it doesn't really matter, Kinda right? Kind of covered, yeah. 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 But how do you do it? Just as simple as we're going to record you? Like, what do you, How do you do it? Agent. You just The agent will say this call is being recorded for quality assurance or do whatever you, do, it may be. Is it listed on your scripting? That's what I usually recommend yes. folks to do is just put it on your scripting so your agent doesn't forget big bold letters don't forget about it yeah. we have it in our scripting a couple yeah. times so it's in there it's it's pretty it's, they know they're being recorded yeah. uh now <laughs> now i'm gonna ask you a question do you record the part where you ask the question oh. are you being recorded so we do record that part mm -hmm. yeah most yeah i think do. most people do I, I think so too uh, and, and personally i don't think that's a problem well because how else are you gonna i don't either you? but yeah. we'll see but we'll see this, yeah exactly Javier might yeah, so there's one other um, ruling that you folks should be aware of. That's out of Pennsylvania. And, and we share this with you more just so that you have awareness that this is not just a California problem. Uh, there are wiretap statutes all across the country. Uh, Florida's got another pretty major one, although that one hasn't really created much uh, litigation, at least not litigation that's gone the plaintiff's way. But in Pennsylvania, uh, there's a real issue because there's a wiretap act uh, there, and the damages are lower. Uh, it's a thousand dollars, a hundred dollars a day, a thousand dollars max uh, actual damages, um, and then uh, attorneys' fees. Correct. 
So it's different because California, there's no attorney's fees available. You just got the massive damage like in TCPA. Uh, in other places, the, the damages have to be actual damages, which is very difficult to show in the setting, but you do get attorney's fees. So, you know, again, there's a big incentive for the plaintiffs to bring these cases. Uh, something to keep in mind, though, there was just a brand new case called Popa. Popa. Um, I love the name Popa. Um, down out there in, um, in Pennsylvania, where the Third Circuit Court of Appeals found that there is no direct recipient uh, protection in Pennsylvania, which is wild. So earlier, I remember I told you in Javier, Assurance, which was the defendant, could not be liable for wiretapping itself, right? It's only potentially liable because it used a third party. In Pennsylvania, at least, at least according to one court, even if you are doing analytics on your own website, you could be violating the Pennsylvania Act, even if you're not using a third party. That not that just mm -hmm. insanity? That's wild, is it not? Um, so be very cautious in Pennsylvania. And the, what the court basically says is, look, I don't want to hear you crying to me that this is hard or that this is going to shut down your ability to help people you know, buy food for a large dog. Uh, by the way, that was just the most random example. I loved it. But <laughs> I, well, the public case was about <laughs> pet stairs, so maybe that's where my mind was. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> yeah, I see what you that, did that there. Consumer. I see what you did there. Um, I like dogs. But, but so. essentially what the Third Circuit Court of Appeals said, you know, cry me a river, you can get consent. If you have consent then you don't have to worry about it. Um, well, the, the Third Circuit also sent the issue of consent back to the district court in the Popa um, to evaluate whether consent recorded through the privacy policy was enough. All right, and yeah. so uh, with that, I think I'm going to go put my hat on uh, because it is time, <laughs> through the power of the Troutman firm, to bring you our exclusive, and I'm really excited for this interview, with Josh Swagger. And now, through the power of the Troutman firm, I'm incredibly excited to welcome Josh Swagger, one of the most prolific plaintiff lawyers out there who's on top of this brand new SIPA claim and is really pushing these things forward, that and some other data privacy issues we're going to talk to him about. Josh, welcome to the show, man. What's going on, everybody? Uh, so, Josh, before we get going, I, I have to tell everyone this story. Uh, you might not even know this, but did you realize that you actually got me my start? doing TCPA class litigation. All right. I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing, but considering but, where you are with your own firm, I mean, it seems like it's a positive. Yeah, look, on the one hand, it's a terrible thing. Uh, on the other hand, it was fantastic. <laughs> so I'll tell you the story, and you may or may not remember this. Um, but so I had never handled the TCPA class action before. You might remember I was a trial lawyer. We'd actually had a couple of individual suits go right. way back to like 2006. Remember this? Um, and, and I had tried a series of fraud trials for, for Wells Fargo was the client, uh, and they were sued in a TCPA class action brought by some guy named Josh Swagger. Uh, and the case was originally not assigned to me, right? It was assigned to some other big law firm out in Los Angeles. Uh, and I'll never forget it, that the in-house lawyer who I'd worked with on the fraud trials uh, reached out to me and said, hey, uh, Eric, do you know this guy named Josh, Josh Swagger? I was like, yeah, I know the guy. And she was like, look, we, he's not getting back to us. <laughs> We'd like him to, to respond <laughs> as a complaint. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Is there, is there anything you can do uh, to get the extension? And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. I'll call the guy. And I called you up. And, of course, you, you picked up my phone then, as, as, you, as you do now. And I appreciate that. Uh, and about 20 minutes later, you know, I had the extension. I call her back. And four hours later, she calls me. She's like, Eric, I'm just going to give you the case. And, of course, that case was Malta. Uh, I was going to say, it sounds like name. Malta. Oh, that, that is right. Uh, and for those of you uh, watching this wondering, so Malta ended up being one of the earliest class action settlements. Actually, Josh, if you remember, you feel free to, to tell everyone about it. It kind of gives a, a sense of your longevity and kind of when you first got involved with TCPA litigation yourself. Yeah, that case goes way back. I think that was one of the first. I mean, we filed a couple other TCPA cases, but I think, you know, the Malta action and we had a couple other ones, you know, against some of the larger banks all around that time. Um you know, after the case law was starting to be developed and, and you picked up one of the first ones. I mean, the Wells Fargo case against Malta, I think that was probably one of the larger ones, especially early on. Yeah, it was it was a remarkable opportunity. And believe it or not, it landed in my lap solely because you returned my phone call and gave my client. <laughs> well, you're so, welcome. So. And now I'm on your podcast. So, I mean, yeah. it comes full and, circle. And the rest is history, buddy. That's right. <laughs> uh, now, remind me, were you involved with the Sally May case, which was the first ever TCPA class settlement? The Sally May case, uh, Arthur, I, I believe. Uh, 
I, I don't recall. I know that we had we had dealt with a lot of those lenders uh, in the in the in one series of cases. I think it was maybe there's three or four cases that we had filed early on that dealt with a lot of the home loans. Um, that name sounds familiar. What our involvement was, I don't know. Now we're going back like you know way over a decade, so I, I'm sure we were involved somehow. Um, I don't know if we we're on the forefront of that one though. Well, and this is what's so beautiful, right? For folks that watch the podcast now, like so many of the, like it's literally intergenerational now, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it's like folks that listen to Bob Dylan and then they start listening to, you know, like a generation later, their kids are, are listening to the same music. You know, when you, and really it was you, it was a boss, yep. right? Jay Edelson, I got to mention him or he'll be pissed if I don't throw him in there, right? You guys were literally on the ground floor creating the concept. And I remember, you might, I, I can guarantee you don't remember this. I remember a conversation we had, Josh. It, we were in the midst of, you know, some arbitration on some goofy individual. I think it was like a, a you know, auto finance case or something we were arbitrating. And you're like, Eric, I'm onto this thing. This was like 2006 or 2007. I'm onto this thing. It's called the TCPA. We are going <laughs> to certify these cases. It's $500 per call. We're going to bring home massive, massive class action settlements. And I remember telling you, Josh, you are crazy. No one is ever going to pay you on one of these TCPA class actions. And man, uh, turns out I don't know anything uh, because you guys pulled it off. Yeah, we got a, we got lucky on a few of them. We did all right. Uh, so so I, I want to lay out uh, a couple of things. Uh, you know, I think I've given a pretty good sense of the past, but Josh, why don't I, I let you actually introduce yourself? I haven't ha had to do that yet. Uh, how do you view your practice? You know, how, how do you view yourself kind of situated in the TCPA world and the consumer pri privacy uh, world more broadly? Yeah, we've been we've been doing, you know, consumer privacy cases. I'm mean, pretty much my own co whole career. I mean, I view the whole area of, of consumer privacy claims it could be from the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act to the FICRA claims, you know, specifically TCPA, though. Um, that was a huge privacy concern. And it still is today. But I mean, back in the heyday of 2006, 2008, I mean, that was a real those are big issues. Um, that, that you know very well. Um, and so we've always been there. You know, you know, my firm's smaller now, uh, but we're still dealing with with consumer privacy claims, but mostly focused to stay here in, in San Diego. I generally only file down in the Southern District. Keeps me off the airplanes, keeps me at home with the family and the kids. And so, you know, life's a little bit better that way. Um, but still bringing similar claims. And then obviously as the law develops, you know, we got the SEPA claims now and some other things probably coming up in the hopper. Um, still privacy related. I mean, we're in the right state for it. Well, so is it fair to call you like semi-retired at this point? Because oh. I mean, you can only have so many houses and cars and boats, right? Not at not at all. I mean, I got two kids. I'm paying for like, they, I mean, they, they're 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 I have to pay for their private tennis coach. I mean, it's like it's just it's it's constant. I'm never gonna retire. Then they're gonna go to college. I'm gonna have to pay for that, and then you know whatever they do after that. So no, it's never gonna end. Yeah, yeah, Josh, Josh, living that hard life. Uh, I know, man. You, you're, you're barely getting by. Uh, but in, but in seriousness. <laughs> Um, so I, I do want to just address this because I mean I, I think it's curious. Um, so Abbas Kazarunian, of course, you know, friend of the show, the godfather of TCPA class actions. I, I mean, I think you deserve equal credit, but for some reason I just decided to credit Josh as, or sorry, credit Abbas as like the inventor of the TCPA class right. actions. It's just not fair to you. You're, you're the Tesla to his Edison, I suppose. Um, <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, Tesla got the last laugh, right? Uh, but but what happened with you guys? You guys were like thick as thieves for like many years, and all of a sudden, like you were going your direction, he was going his direction. Yeah, I mean, look, we practiced together for 15 years. I mean, Abbas is is a is an excellent lawyer. I mean, he's a he's a charismatic person. You know that. Um, and and I think we were we did very well together. You know, we complimented each other. Um, you know, and, and I think we built a firm. I mean, even though it was two different names, I mean, it was really uh, quite developed after 15 years. Um, you know, it's just a question of of you know, we're just a little bit different places, right? You know, I am married. I got two young kids. He's not, and and you know he can do that jet set lifestyle, and and we're on planes every day, um, going somewhere. Um, it's kind of tough after a while, you know, when your kids are growing up. So you know, my partner retired, and and uh, you know, I think for me it was time to downsize a little bit. I mean, look, I, I I have all the love for the guy in the world. He's a great lawyer. He's doing great things, especially you know with what he's got going in in Las Vegas. Um, you know, but when we, but I think we still have like this spirited competition that two people would, you know, and so I want to see what the next best thing is and who can, who can do better and, and do the best. Um, but you know, lots of love to the guy. And I, I don't think there's any animosity between the two of us. 
Well, so you, you listen to the cats in the cradle one too many time and you're like, wait a second, <laughs> I got to actually be there for my kids. Uh, what is yeah. That's definitely part of it. It's definitely part of it. That, that's, a, that's a disgusting and yet wonderful sentiment. Uh, good job, yeah. Josh. I didn't, I didn't view you as a sentimental fellow, but I suppose you might be. <laughs> uh, all right. So at some point, though, uh, I think you were telling me before we started recording that, that you've kind of moved away from TCPA, which is somewhat damaging for my audience because they're like, whoa, why are we talking about non-TCPA issues? But what you're moving into, though, is very important for the audience, which, of course, is SIPA and more broadly the privacy litigation that, of course, the Troutman firm is, is known for as well. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about kind of where you've been, why you're moving away from the TCPA and what you're moving into? I mean, listen, I, and, I, and I think you've positioned yourself right. I mean, you've really, you know, while I appreciate the credit giving you your first TCPA uh, case, I mean, you have always been on the cutting edge of the TCPA. I mean, you, you'd fight these cases the way they should be fought. And then I guess when it's time to, time to settle, you always come up with a creative way to do it, you know, in the best interest of your clients. So you know what you're doing. The, the TCPA is not going away. Um, I think it's just it's just changed. And obviously, it's fairly well developed. I mean, when you get a case that goes up to the Supreme Court and starts redefining things, there's a lot of, of questions that I think have become answered. Um, and, and there's a lot of people bringing these cases. Um, it, so it's kind of nice, at least for me, like when I started the, the, the practice in the TCPA, a lot of these questions were unanswered. Um, we didn't know what those were, and it's kind of nice to be on the forefront and and make some of that law some good, you know, some maybe not so good. And so the way I look at at the at the SIPA claims, it's really the same way, right? It's somewhat of a blank slate. We've got a couple cases that have gone up um, to the California Supreme Court, maybe the Ninth Circuit weighing in on those things. Um, but it's really a blank slate. And to me, it's 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 interesting, and it's nice to be able to try to shape that law and hopefully correctly for my side. Um, you know, I know I have adversaries like you, Eric, out there and maybe make it go the other way. But that's the fun of it, right? It's it's to kind of put your mark on on that those areas. And so that's what I see that the SEPA claims going. TCPA is still alive and well, and there's still a lot of like nuanced issues. But you know, it's kind of nice to to make new, you know, plow new fields and, and make inroads and, and stuff that hasn't been developed. You like that virgin snow field. You want to go run and seeing your footprints all over it. I know what you mean, man. I can feel that. Uh, yeah. in fact. Uh, we had Jay Edelson on actually as as our uh, third guest, our third episode, and we talked about Javier and we talked about um, the, the the SIPA claims and the wiretap statute, uh, which I know we're going to pivot to right now. Uh, I'll just throw it out there that that Jay was horrified uh, that this this firm uh, Berger and Fisher went and took a claim involving Active Prospect, right? Which I think we all agree is a consumer friendly kind of enterprise, right? They're trying to capture consent so that people don't get unwanted robocalls. Um, and in a case where the guy actually did accept terms and conditions and did ultimately consent to be recorded, yet because they recorded the consent being given, the Ninth Circuit essentially found that it was like in really gotcha fashion. Well, hey, you recorded the part where you asked him if you could record him and he hadn't said yes yet. And so you wiretapped. Uh, Jay was mortified. I mean, that's my characterization. You can watch the, the episode for yourself uh, that that Berzer took that case. Uh, he was obviously pleased with how the case turned out, but he was just thinking, my God, like they could have ruined the entire thing right there. Um, when you're bringing cases like are, are you are you trying to, to just kind of bring volume? Are you looking for quality? Like what kinds of cases are you looking to bring? Um, you know, you don't have to talk about anything that's currently pending. I'm just trying to get your sense, and you can talk about Javier too if you think you've got an opinion on what Berger did, if that's something you would have done or not. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's interesting. You know, I was I was following these cases, and they had been pending again. You know, we, we, you and I have been doing this twenty years. So when I give you the date range, you may be just wrong. I, I thought these types of cases, especially by Berger Fisher and some other firms, had been pending for a while. Let's call it to me a year, or maybe eighteen months. You had seen a couple of these cases being filed. You know, we we're following the case law. Um, and it didn't seem like they were getting a lot of traction, at least when you're following the district court levels, right? I can't think of one 12B6 that had survived. I mean, most of them got dismissed. And so, you know, I can't speak for, for Bursar Fisher, but it looked to me that they were trying to find the right case to go up. And I think, in fact, they had a couple cases up there, uh, if, if my research is correct. And one of the cases that we were looking at and seeing where we thought it was going to be an interesting decision you know, you follow the docket and it's just dismissed. 
And so you're like, what what happened there? Did they know something we didn't? And so I, I think Javier came in and maybe they liked the argument, you know, on the panel. They liked the panel they got. So they, it seemed to me that they abandoned this other case. And all of a sudden, this this unpublished decision comes out in Javier, obviously good for our side and the plaintiff's side. Um, and so I, I don't know. I think they had I think they had a little better um, concept and maybe plan on how to kind of shape the law they wanted to. And even though maybe looking at just the case and the facts on Javier, I think they had a, a couple a couple nets in the water, a couple irons in the fire, and I think that one just seemed to turn out better for them. And they kind of rode that horse, and you know, to to our thank God, and that's the way it came out. But I, I think it was more planned. I don't think it was luck, and they just planned to bring that Javier case. I think had some other things going on. So, you know, it's rem- reminiscent to me of when a boss took marks to the Ninth Circuit, right? And he drew the three Bush appointee panel. And he stands up there, and if anyone wants to go dig it up, you can listen to the oral argument. And he literally tells this Ninth Circuit panel, you basically have to rewrite the TCPA because otherwise my client doesn't have a remedy. And everyone, everyone out there is like, you're nuts, right? And he used to tell, he was telling me the last time I had my podcast that, you know, a bunch of people who will be nameless, right, on the plaintiff side, were calling him up, cursing him, telling him, what are you doing? You're going to destroy the TCPA. And, of course, the guy walks away with the biggest win from the plaintiff's perspective in the history of the TCPA when the Marks panel came back in his Listen, favor. I, it kind of reminds me of that. Look, I, I was involved in Marks, as I, as you said in the beginning of the show. I mean, Abbas and I were involved in every single case. I mean, we would take every deposition together. You know, we took up Marks. Um, I don't I think we might have had oral argument at the district level, which was kind of a rare thing down in the Southern District. I think he argued at the district level, went up to the Ninth Circuit. He and I were both very, very involved in the briefing. I mean, you know, he and I pretty much wrote that brief. And then it came down to oral argument and it was a coin flip on who was going to argue that thing. And I didn't thank- know that. Thank God he he won because he did a, a hell of a job. I mean, he and I spent it two weeks in a room going through that. And I was I was the panel arguing, you know, making asking all these questions. And by the time he was done, he really he really did a great job. And I was there sitting second chair at the Ninth Circuit and listening to him argue. And all I could think about was, thank God I'm not up there doing it because he just did it. He just did a really, really top notch job. Um, he lived and breathed that case going into into the uh, oral argument. And, um, you know, I was there, you know, it didn't go well for the other side. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we were, you know, we're colleagues with, with the, the attorneys on the other side and, uh, can we name them? Can we, shall we name them? Yeah, I, I, I have a bad memory. You probably know him, but you know, you can name them. Um, I, I mean, okay. I'm pretty sure it was Ian and Greenberg, right? Or my mistake. Yeah, it was, it was. Council? Yeah, it, it was those guys. It was, right. yeah. And yeah, he I did mean, a hell of a job on his side too. And, 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 and I agree with you, Eric, it was just the panel. And and it could have come down totally different with a different panel. Um, and I think we just got lucky, you know, whenever whenever you whenever you draw your panel, right? It's like two days before, three days before, and you're looking at that going, how is it gonna come out? Um, and, and I think we just got lucky on that because a different panel, I think Ann would have would have maybe mopped the floor with us, you know. But the, that day the the stars aligned and the, but listen, Abbas, if you listen to that oral argument, I mean, I don't think it, it gives it gives um, credence unless you're sitting there making those arguments and watching him. He really did a great job. He really did a great well, job. I was very impressed. I, I, I have not asked a boss this yet. Um, how upset, if if that's the right word, maybe it's not, uh, were you or was he when Sergey Lemberg, of all human beings, took the ATTS issue all the way to the Supreme Court? So but go, going back to... Um, I'm trying to think of the 408 discussions. I'll, I'll tell you what on on um, and I haven't listened, so I don't know what he said or maybe what I can say. But going back to Marx, listen, it, it's done. It's in stone. It's been chiseled out by the Ninth Circuit. The Supreme Court's taken different issues. He and I were nervous as hell about that case. And if we could have got out of that case, uh, we would have. We would have. No, absolutely. Absolutely. We absolutely would have. We would have so settled that case to get rid of that case and not on a class basis because we were getting calls. We were getting hate mail from other lawyers going, you guys are going to screw this up. And he and I would be like, we do not want to be the prize. Let somebody else take this thing up. We would have settled that case uh, before that before. Our argument. Absolutely. Hang on. Hang on. So marks would have never happened. The plaintiff's lawyers were willing to give it up. And the defense lawyer refused to settle the case and then lost well i'm not i'm not saying that there were there were active settlement discussions i don't want to put ian out there but i am telling you now that it's said and done abbas and i would have settled that case for sure 
There's no question. We were very, very nervous about that case. And listen, yeah, looking back, you know, because you, you could be a, a, a Monday morning quarterback, you know, a couch surfing quarterback, and you go, of course, we had it planned all the time. We were nervous as hell about Marks, and we knew that we were probably on the losing side of that case. But but what are you going to do? You're before the Ninth Circuit. You you got to take the case through unless you can get the case resolved. And and, you know, I think Ian had a had a good ruling coming out of the Southern District. The briefing was going his way. It, it was the level of preparation on behalf of Abbas. I mean, listen, he did he did a hell of a job and we got a good panel. And so we got a good decision. But wow, that's just that's just hubris. That is absolute hubris. I have never seen a case as a defense lawyer where I thought that the plaintiffs were going to capitulate. They were willing to write a small check. I had a ruling below in my favor. And I was like, nah, I'm just going to go all the way because I want my name carved in TCPA history on an appeal. Well, you know what? Your name, your everyone's name is carved in history, right? <laughs> and and you're on the right side of the ledger, and and Ian, God bless him, is on the wrong side. Well, um, sometimes it's just, sometimes you're lucky though, right? And it's just we all take our risks, you know, roll the dice, take our chances. So you know, could have gone the other way for sure. That's pretty. That's pretty wild. All right, so so you, you dodged my question on Sergey Lemberg. Maybe I'll let that go. No, uh, but no. I, listen, I I look, th- but there there's a good example, Eric. You know, I, I mean, I'm not a guy who wants like the fortune and fame of my name out there on all this stuff going up to this. To, I, I'd hate to be the person to lose that, right? Because, you know, you go on this podcast and you ask about, instead you're asking Abbas about how you guys won marks. And now we can talk about, well, how'd you, how'd you screw up the TCPA for the rest of the plaintiffs by defining the ATDS, especially from a justice who just took the bench and had a great decision on the lower appellate court, right? It, and, and, and in all its, it's all its intricacies of, of the English language and how to apply this stuff. Um, of course you do how that decision was going to, who, who's going to write that decision? Well, I mean, did you see, though, I did a podcast at my former firm. You may, you may have watched this. I actually had Sergey on Unprecedented. That was the name of the previous podcast. And I asked the guy before oral argument, Sergey, if this goes badly at oral argument, if Justice Barrett, at the time she had not been confirmed, if Justice Barrett, who just decided Gattelhawk going against you, is confirmed, are you going to think about settling the case? And he was like, to that. No. Absolutely. It was my guilty pleasure. I did listen to that podcast and because everybody was watching it, right? Everybody was watching that case and we wanted the insight. And I thought you did a, you did a good job. It was very informative of the podcast, but it looked like he was pot committed, man. He wasn't going to back down. He wasn't going to back down. And and, I, and I'll tell you what, it, it, in all, you know, just confidentially between us and everybody listening, right, is I had a ton of cases that were on file that were kind of in the settlement track. And he was either going to settle one way or he was going to settle for less. And after oral argument, I was making like speed dial calls to mediators going, get me the hell out of these cases. Like if the offer's still there, take it because this is not going to go our way, you know. And so it was time to it was time to cut bait. <laughs> I love it. Um, so real quick, since we're talking TCPA, I meant to kind of talk a little bit more with SIPA, but I love talking TCPA and I love it, Josh, that we can tell war stories. You've been there through all the battles, just like I have. You know, I always tell people, man, if you could see my metaphorical back, you'd see all these scars and like I'm <laughs> wounded from top to bottom. I know you're the same. Yeah. Um, but but footnote seven, does that give you because I had of Adrian on the podcast a couple episodes again uh, ago. And, you know, he's like, man, footnote seven, it opens the door. We're still fighting the fight. ATDS is still a thing. I, I'm assuming that you agree that, you know, ATDS cases are dead. Listen, ATDS cases are, 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 are dead. I mean, I, I filed a recent case. Um, we'll see where it goes. I mean, listen, the, the, the definitional sections and stuff, that's something that's something I don't think should be fought, right? If it's another claim, if you're dealing with other class cert issues, to me, those are kind of open, open issues, you know, and maybe it's a coin flip on certification, but ATDS personally, for me, uh, it's time, it's time to move on. I just don't, I don't see it. Maybe look, the plaintiff's far is, is always evolving and, and we're, we're smart. But, you know, to me, you know, the TCPA wave is like kind of crashed and and, and uh, it's kind of petered out with regard to the ATDS. That's at least my view. You know, Supreme Court spoken. You might get some decisions that can slice it a little bit differently. But I think they're better claims personally. And 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 from a plaintiff side, and I think you've talked about it, too, is we have to make decisions, right? We have to make decisions which cases we're going to put our resources in, our time, our money for what type of result. And you kind of look at that and say, look, is that truly a good investment? Maybe, maybe. I guess it depends what theories you come at. But if you're hanging your note, your 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 case in your bank account on footnote seven, 
I mean, maybe you got a little bit more disposable income than I do, but I mean, these are expensive cases to litigate, and and, and I think there's money to be made elsewhere. Uh, so speaking about making money elsewhere, buddy, let's talk about SIPA. Um, so Berger went out there. They got the big Javier ruling, horrifying or otherwise. Uh, now, were you already filing these cases before Javier? Did you kind of wait and then see Javier and say, oh, man, that's where I'm coming? And then you filed a bunch. Like, what was your play? So we we were following those cases. They were because I thought they were good cases from the beginning. I really did. I thought, you know, our analysis of it, Bursar Fisher, you know, Jay Ellison has been filing some of these cases, too. I think the analysis was correct, but it didn't appear that the court was going to go there. Um, but you, you have to, for, this is my, my personal view. You got this dichotomy, right? I mean, you have a state law statute, which is going to take forever if it's ever going to go through the appellate process and versus if you file it in the district court under CAFA or whatever, maybe I'm in another type of jurisdiction and you're going to get a decision right away. It's not binding, you know, necessarily on the state courts, just like Javier isn't right. And in my opinion, that's why they unpublished the decision. I mean, that they made some very strong statements about interpreting California law, but I think they want to have be deferential to California. And maybe when it finally goes up to the appellate level or, or eventually, you know, Todd Friedman takes it up to the to the uh, California Supreme Court and gets another W for us. You know, maybe that's going to go, but it's going to take a long time. Uh, and so, you know, I think those cases are ripe now, especially after the Javier decision came out. And, and again, but I mean, I can't think of one case that went our way at the district level before Bursar Fisher, you know, pulled that one out. Yeah. And, and the reason why, Josh, and I say this with love, because truly, I, I, I do love you because they're terrible cases. Right. I mean, that, that, <laughs> this is not let's be real. When when the wiretap statute was passed back in the 70s, it, it was not to apply to web session replay technology where folks that are running websites are just kind of hiring analytics teams to look at what's happening on their website. That is not wiretapping. Come on, man, just admit it. No one's look, listening. No one's not, listening. not at all. In fact, I think it's absolutely the opposite. It's because this technology wasn't even thought of, let alone developed in the 1970s. But when you take how, a how look- did you at, not just prove my point, by the way? But keep going. You, well, be, because my second point is, if you take a look at the legislative history and the, the purpose behind that statute, it was purposely designed and meant to, to continue to evolve with current technology. That was the purpose of the statute. Uh, and so this is, just a, this is just another iteration of that. Oh, Josh, OK, stop it. The, the statute does not say this statute is meant to be interpreted and evolve with te technology moving forward. Believe it or not, the TCPA actually has worse that effect in the legislative history and in the FCC's rulings. Six, section 631.1, is 631.1? What's the exact section? You're going to know off the top of your head, Josh. Well, just well, well, well let, let, oh, let's sorry. talk about section 1.5 generally. That's what I'm talking about. So 631, yes, you're right. 631 deals with the wiretapping. And then we deal with, um, you know, we got the, the voice printing. That's a whole separate section. OK, and yeah, then yeah. you deal with like electronic tracking. But it's all under the 630, 630 sec, but specifically 1.5. Right. That's where the privacy under the penal code comes in. All right. And, and you're telling me that somewhere in that statute in legislative history, words to the effect of and this is supposed to evolve into the future for technological changes they're in there they're in there josh Word, or words oh. of those effect absolutely it, it wasn't there wasn't passed just to be in a vacuum of whatever was going on in the 1970s and 80s it wasn't it was supposed to evolve and i think and i think when you take a look at the case law um and i, th I think the courts the courts agree with that because california has very strong privacy rights you know it's in the constitution um and I mean, they're just getting stronger, especially with some of the other legislation that's being passed other than SIPA, right? I mean, it, it's you, you you have a hard time arguing that that our privacy rights are getting narrowed, especially in California. It's just the opposite. True. Look, I don't disagree with you there, but but you know, when technology outruns a statute, generally the way it's supposed to work is the legislature is supposed to pass a new statute, not just you take words that don't really apply and then you try to like square peg round hole it to apply to the new technology, right? I mean, am I missing something? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just having flashbacks from like our conversations in 2006 about the TCPA. When you're saying like, what are you talking about? This isn't going to go anywhere. But but when it comes down to it, the same, at least my belief, right? And I think everybody from the plaintiff's bar, bar where we're, we're dealing with these consumer privacy rights, it's the same issue as it relates to TCPA as it would relate to SIPA. What's the problem with having ins consent, informed consent, instead of doing these things in the backdrop, um, What's wrong with that? And I think that's exactly what Javier is saying. I mean, 
there was some interpretation of the law, but they sent it back to say, well, when was this consent given and possibly the scope of that consent, right? Because they could say, look, you there could be a finding that that, that was proper consent given, so you don't have a claim at all. I mean, that's that's specifically my interpretation of Favier and those facts. And so that's all the right. whole issue. What about what about consent? So let's zoom out real quick because some of you are watching thinking, what in the world are these guys even talking about? OK, so let's reorient for a second. California, right, has a statute. It's called the California Invasion of Privacy Act. There are several sections to it, as Josh was correctly pointing out. Uh, most famously, of course, is, is 632, right? And that's the statute that requires two-party consent in order to record calls. These sections are found in the penal code because technically a violation is, or is actually a crime in California. But there's also a private right of action uh, that authorizes $2,500 to up to $5,000 per violation, which is very attractive to guys like Josh. Uh, so 631 was actually a section that came before 632, as the number sequence might indicate, um, and it looks at wiretapping as opposed to call recording. And in fact, at the time 631 was passed, uh, people tried to enforce the wiretapping statute in the context of call recording, and the U.S. Supreme Court, or sorry, the California Supreme Court back in the 1970s said, no, recording a conversation is not wiretapping because only a third party can wiretap and a party to a communication, a, a, a phone call, cannot wiretap themselves. That led, of course, to the passage of 632 the next year. So 631, though, again, focused on wiretapping, requires several kind of very specific requirements that I always look at and say there's no way this is met in the context of uh, web session replay technology. So what is web session replay technology? Well, the most famous example for those of you in the TCPA world, and all of you are in the TCPA world, is Active Prospect and Jurnaya. These technologies uh, put a essentially a Java pixel onto a website, and they record not an actual visual rendering, but a bunch of data about what took place during any web session when a consumer goes onto that website. These products exist specifically to protect people from TCPA liability because you have to be able to demonstrate that somebody actually went onto a website, clicked a consent button, and what the actual content of the disclosure was on the specific day that the experience on that website was recorded. And of course, that's what Active Prospect and Jernia do. Now, some enterprising lawyers at a firm called Berzer and Fisher argued that the Jernia, sorry, in that case, it was actually the Active Prospect constituted wiretapping because it was a third party recording in real time and interpreting, which is required under the statute, the uh, information exchange between two parties over a wire. Now, of course, when we think about going onto a website, we don't think of that as a telephone call, like a wire transmission, but the court found that it was, and it also found that the, the uh, gathering of information, web session recording, constituted the act of interpreting in real time the communication by a third party without consent, hence it met the requirements of the wiretapping statute, section 631. So hopefully you're all now caught up, okay? Now, Josh, is, what we're going to talk about next is, Josh, you're not limiting, though, your complaints to Active Prospect or Jernia, there's a whole wide world of other forms of web session recording that are taking place. Can you tell us about that? Well, I mean, the, 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 the case law and the cases are developing, obviously, and I think we're at the forefront of it. Um, you know, you can see some of the cases that we filed. Um, Bob Johns, I think, is one that's pending currently. How dare, how dare you, sir? Well, I just throw, it seemed to make the news. You know, so there, there's there's a whole lot of other cases that are going to be that are going to be coming out. Um, you'll see on, on the class action context, I think in the arbitration context that deal with not just, you know, 631, um, but but also in maybe some of the data sharing practices as well um, that I think will probably fit into the definition of 631 and some of the other statutes um, in the same context. And that's based on some of the 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 website um i'm trying to talk in broad broad context here you know just the way the website is developed to track and capture not just you know the 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 session replay but some of the other information that's being transmitted without knowledge or consent um that's that's where i see the the case law going and then where the cases are going to be filed i mean we have we have quite a few more that are that are probably ready to go interesting yeah and so it, what it comes down to right in my view is and Jay made this point, right? He's like, okay, Troutman. So you know, as as you are apt to do, you take the example that is most consumer friendly, right? Active Prospect or Naya, literally, they're just there to capture the consent record. They're totally innocent, good consumer friendly 
companies doing good things, in my opinion. But, you know, as Jay pointed out, you know, there's some other uses of web session replay technology that are not quite so pure and, and lily white. And some of those include, of course, um, literally capturing keystrokes for the purpose of mining certain private information, mining certain maybe passwords, mining information that is truly starts to look more like wiretapping when you think about, you know, who do you want to have access to those passwords that you're typing in or your credit card numbers that you're typing in. Um, and, you know, I have to admit, you know, Jay, Jay has a point. And, and I think, you know, kind of that's what you're driving at as well. Um, but to me, right, yeah, and this is the way it always works it, between the plaintiff's bar and the defense bar, right? Now, of course, even though I'm a defense lawyer, I sometimes sit in the middle because I like to see and speak truth, right? Cases like Javier with Active Prospect are ridiculous. That case should never be brought. On the other hand, in examples where you've got third parties that are, you know, invited onto a website by, you know, a Cambridge Analytica or whoever, right? Somebody that's not really keeping their own consumers' interests in mind, allowing somebody else to come in, take a bunch of, of information, sell it on the dark market, whatever they're going to want to do with it, okay? And that consumer doesn't know, and it has no benefit to that consumer, and it's being monetized, and that consumer is now at risk. Okay, right? Like you got my attention. Maybe that does start to sound a little bit more like wiretapping, you know, even if to your point, there's some little language somewhere in some term and condition, right? You can imagine a worst case scenario where it's like, whoa, that consumer is being duped. I know you won't agree with me, but the active prospect scenario is the exact opposite extreme. There is nothing wrong with active prospect. And of course, but it's the stuff in the middle, right? Which is where all the battles are going to be fought because you're not. I'm sure if you could make a living, Josh, only pursuing the real, real bad guys, you would do that. But of course, there's just not enough of that out there. So you're going to bring some of these gray cases. Um, but, you know, setting aside the names of the people that you're suing, I just want to try to give the examples to the listeners, right, of, of what kinds of technologies are being targeted specifically. I mean, are we talking about like Google Analytics? Uh, like what kinds of, of replay technology are we, and analytic companies are we looking at? I mean, there there are current cases. I mean, there is there's been a, a case against Google uh, that's been dealing with you know the analytics, the data sharing. Uh, that's that's for the, for the big boys and girls. I mean, not for me. And that's been going on for many years. I think it's probably going going to go on for many more years. Um, you know, just like the cases you know probably similar about Facebook. And so to me, you know, those aren't really the the targets. But it's it's the I think it's the, the the defendants or the companies who are using, let's say, you know, some of the Facebook analytics, Facebook um, SDK, uh, in the background and selling that, pushing that information off for whatever reason. And I don't know; these cases are are new as far as they're developing, um, and so I haven't got through all the depositions and taken all that stuff with all the experts on exactly what they're doing, what the value is of that. But there is there's a lot of it. You know, one of them, the case, I mean, it's public. I mean, that's exactly what HBO Max was doing. I don't know if you're you're familiar with that case. It's filed as a class action, and the only re reason it was defeated, at least on a class-wide basis, is because of the the uh, the class-wide arbitration agreement. And so those cases, I have those. They're going through uh, the arbitration, but that's exactly what they were doing. They had you know those embedded pixels that they were sending information from. You're watching your HBO Max. It was being associated with your Facebook account, and all that data was being sent out. You know, without your knowledge or consent. You know, that's the scary stuff. Um, you know. The same thing this is way back in the day now but when you take a look at, at zoom um that's exactly what they were doing and, and as soon as that case was filed i mean they stopped that that they unplugged the facebook sdk you know and the, they had other claims go through but those were the strong claims because they knew that they were capturing people's data and selling that stuff for a profit there's no other reason why they'd stop um uh, unplug that little piece of it and then settle for what they did um so there's still a lot of companies that are doing exactly that but for a company that's not selling the data third party, they're just recording it for their own purposes, uh, maybe to make their, their user experience on their website more effective, right? I, I mean, I, I know I'm not going to get you to agree to this you know, live here on the air, but I, I mean, you have to agree with me. There's going to be some valid use of third party web session re replay technology that at least doesn't fit the spirit of wiretapping, even if to your, your point, it fits the, the technical legal definition. I think there are some good examples, and in reading some of the literature, there there is a purpose that could be consumer oriented on why that technology is useful. I mean, as an example, I've read some some articles where that technology has been employed, where people are trying to to go through a transaction, let's say on a website, and they keep getting hung up. Well, instead of getting on the phone or the chat bot, 
they can actually see where they're being hung up on and they can probably change the website or whatever um, you know in the background to make that user experience more seamless. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. Again, it's just an issue of one, consent, but two, if you're sending all that data off, how are we supposed to be assured that that's what the information is going to be used for, right? And it's not going to be collected and be subject to another data breach somewhere later on, or it's going to be sold uh, later on to someone else without our consent. And I think that's the question. Fascinating. Josh, remind me, what are the damages? How much are you looking to recover in these cases? Well, I think that depends on how you interpret the statute. So certain provisions, you know, will call for, you know, $5,000 per per violation, you know, under under 631, I think it's written in there, it's $2,500 per violation. There's another argument that any portion of violation of, of 1.5, the entire chapter should default to the 5,000. Um, that hasn't been litigated yet. Maybe I'll be the one that to do that. But I mean, look, at least when you're dealing with 631, $2,500 a violation, I mean, that's that's still eye-watering. I mean, that's still, that's, there's still serious damages. Are you concerned about standing argument? I guess it depends. I mean, that's why I practice in the Ninth Circuit in the Southern District. I mean, we do pretty well down here, you know. Um, I, I I think we'd I think we'll be okay. I think I think we'll be okay. All right, fair enough. I won't probe too deeply because the case law there is not developed. Obviously, you know, I look at this case similar to a data breach case. I wonder if there's Article Three issues. Um, I wonder about causation. Um, in well, in but, most I mean, that's cases, fine. but going back with the data breach. Where, where is this? Here you have you have a statute that provides the remedy and the statutory damage. When the data breaches, you don't, unless you're talking about the CCPA, and let's assume it applies, the process applied right, and now you're dealing with the statutory damages. But absent that, I mean, where where is the statutory damages in the data breach cases? I mean, they, you just don't, you generally don't have them. Yeah, but even if you don't have a, a, you know the statutory remedy, there's still other common law remedies that could be brought, but the courts have largely shut the door to those on standing grounds, right? Article 3 in particular, and of course, that's the big callback to the TCPA, right? Where you've got the big fat statutory damages, private right of action enabled, clear articulation of what the procedural protections are that Congress has has enacted, but that procedural protection violation does not necessarily cause a substantive real life harm, right? And that's where all the Article Three litigation comes from in the TCPA context. It's very similar to me, at least, to my little beady TCPA eyes, right? This is a very similar concept when you start talking about SIPA, because yes, there are procedural protections, maybe. I mean, I'm gonna argue substantively that that's not wiretapping, but let's assume that it is wiretapping, right? So thou you know, has the, the protection to not be wiretapped, but still to be in federal court, you have to have Article Three concrete harm. And again, that's to me, that's the allegory with the data breach cases, because in both cases, your data is being misused, right, would be the way of looking at it, without your knowledge, without your consent. But in the data breach context, unless it leads to damages, the mere fact that there's a risk that you might be harmed in the future has not been found to be risk of, a, or, sorry, excuse me, a true concrete harm today. And I wonder if the wiretapping is more or less the same. I, I presume you disagree. Uh, it's it's possible. I, I think in the in the context of just the data breach, the case law probably isn't as, as good. And I've watched that as well and been a part of some of it. I mean, the case law, you're right. It, 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 the courts are very concerned about damages, at least at the district level. And again, how many cases have really gone up on in the California appellate courts? Um, so I, I hear you. I mean, the, the judges seem to kind of you know, raise an eyebrow a little bit when you're talking about data breach. But again, it depends on the scope. And so let's say if you take a look at the T-Mobile the data breach as an example, when you're dealing with, you know, driver's license numbers, social security numbers and dates of birth for certain people, you know, versus maybe a, a hash password. I mean, that's a totally different case. And I think you have to be careful about what type of case you're going to bring because um, you'll probably get a different result. All right. So, look, we're about to wind down here. Before we do, though, I want to give you an opportunity to really scare our clients to death, uh, which is you're pursuing these as a class action, not just individually. Is that right? The, the cases we can't pursue as a class action, we pursue as a class action, you bet. So, and so the concept is, my mind's gonna get blown here. The concept is then that every single person that has visited that website over the course of the class period is gonna be suing for every visit, 2,500 bucks each. Is that right? That That's that's the way the math works out, you bet. So if you've got, I'm just, just doing this in my head. So if you've got a million people that come to your website, right, or I mean, heck, let's say you've got, yeah, let's go with a million. You've got a million people that come to your website. You certify that case. 
That's twenty five hundred dollars times a million. What is that? I don't even know what that works out to. But it's you know, I, I I started out with an accounting degree, and then like I figured I couldn't do math, so I decided to go to law school, and I didn't do too much better, but at least I passed the bar. So I don't know. It's a big number. It's a big number, um, and it's a lot of risk. And it's a lot yeah, of risk. This is, this is the TCPA all over again, man. And I'm glad uh, that you took a few minutes to talk with our audience about it because I mean, this is it's funny. As you know, I focus really the the, the lion's share, the lion's <laughs> share of my practice is TCPA. But I mean, I'm increasingly moving toward these SIPA cases because I mean, this web session replay technology case. I mean, twenty five hundred dollars per millions of people visiting the website. That is a lot of risk. That is a lot of exposure. And of course, I am nothing but, but a big game hunter. I want to keep my clients safe from the biggest, most complex, scariest cases out there. And for the longest time, that was the TCPA. I mean, it's been the TCPA for, for you know over a decade now. But slowly, I'm starting to look at the SIPA. And I, I, you know, I never, ever, ever, ever get that jealous eye, right? I've never got that grass is greener mentality. But all of a sudden with SIPA, I'm like, wait a second. If this thing takes hold, I mean, this could really be big, you know, in the same way, the same glint in my eye when I saw the TCPA way back in 2008. And I thought, wait a second, this is going to be big. And obviously you see it the same way. I mean, look, at I followed you then. I might be following you now, Josh. What's going on, man? Well, I mean, listen, I, I've always respected you as a, as a lawyer, Eric. I mean, look, on, on, even as an adversary, I mean, you, you, you're a very smart lawyer. And I know, you know, what, what you focus on with your clients is just to protect them on the liability side. So if it's SIPA, if it's TCPA, I know you got your best interest at, at your client's best interest at heart. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a time to kind of do a deep dive on this and see if, if you really do feel that there's some exposure out there. I mean, if the answer is no, then keep doing what you're doing. But if not, you know. You might want to watch out. I mean, that this this uh, this train's starting to roll. All right, man. I'm going to ask you the last question, which I'll ask all my guests. It's a really tough question for you, actually, because you're a plaintiff's lawyer, and most of my guests are. But the, the question is, what can folks that are listening to my podcast, right, and assume that these are are largely these are legitimate businesses, these are folks that care about compliance, largely call centers, but also uh, digital marketers, people that have websites, publishers. Um, you know, what can they do to protect themselves against the risk of something like a SIPA claim being brought by a guy like Josh Swagger? Or as I like to frame it, what can folks do to deserve to win? Well, I, I mean, look, I think, first of all, you got to you, look, I, I'm a big person on compliance. I don't do compliance. OK, like you do. You sit down with your with your clients on the front end and go, look, you're investing in me to make sure that you guys are in compliance with the law, if it's a TCPA or the SIPA. But either way it goes, the business is going to be paying for compliance. So they're going to do it on the front end or they're going to ignore where the case law is going and, and all these things that are out there. And then we'll deal with the compliance for them because we're going to file a case and we're going to point out exactly what they're doing wrong, why they haven't followed you know, their, the websites and, and, and really made it uh, compliant with the current state of the law. So either way, they're going to do it. So um, you know, they can't, they might be able to defer it, but they're not going to be able to ignore that forever. So, you know, if they're going to, and I, and I, again, it's, it's kind of risk-free because I mean, I don't know who's going to, there's going to be people who don't do it. They should be looking for folks like you uh, and who do follow the case law and follow these trends and say, look, this is what you got to clean up. You know, yeah, maybe you don't have nefarious purposes um, on some of these things, but it could be viewed the other way by, by the plaintiff's bar and you got real exposure here. So, I mean, it's going to keep you in business, uh, and I'm sure some of your listeners are going to take you up on that, and, and probably rightfully so. Well, I appreciate you, Josh. As all, man, you were, you were brilliant back in 2006 when I met you. You're brilliant today. Thank you for all of your insight, and thanks for being on the show, man. I appreciate it. All right, guys. I appreciate you having me. Wow. I mean, I love Josh Swagger. That guy is fantastic. Um, he's got just a ton of credibility really 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 cool guy um and i tell you when he says he's pivoting from tcpa into sipa i mean that's something everybody needs to hear loud and clear um well let's get some thoughts i'm gonna start with you today Pooja. uh we usually go to you last we're gonna go to you yeah first no today. worries um i mean i'm just more excited about sipa world now uh i'm gonna have to have josh come back when we do the sipa podcast hopefully we start incorporating those Wait, um, i thought this was the sipa podcast this was just an introduction to sipa on the tcpa deserve to win podcast so okay, uh, okay. maybe we'll have tori take over sipa since uh there's jail time associated with it and she may <laughs> be able to run with it uh and anyway um look I've had a lot of respect from Josh since the Marks days, right? And to recap on those days when you and, uh, not you, sorry, when uh, him and who's his partner? Um, 
Uh, a boss. A boss. Sorry. If a I was boss. Your name. best friend. Um, yeah. The days of a boss and Josh were just those were cool days. I'll never forget the day when Barks came out and Eric was traveling. He's like, "Who's blogging this?" And he was on a plane um, because of how important of a ruling that was. Actually, it wasn't and on a plane. I was actually in arbitration. You were somewhere, <laughs> and the whole team was scattering around and making sure we got it right because that ruling was huge. Um, and knowing that Josh was behind that, uh, also with a boss, I can only imagine what he's going to be behind on some of these SIPA rulings. Yeah, that was great. I mean, you know, I have a lot of respect for the guy because you know I, I have to put a hat on when I talk to him, and I just had to take the hat off immediately yeah. afterwards. Um, so. I, I just know. love how humble the guy is too. Oh, he's right? a great, he's, he's a great he's a guy. Good, good, good guy. No, he's he's fantastic. I, I love the the behind the scenes on Marks. I thought that was really very special. I loved. Um, I, I tried to get him to take a dig at Lemberg. He wouldn't. He wouldn't He do wouldn't it. quite he go there. He's just too classy, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's great. Good thoughts there, yeah. Pooja. And, and just his whole take on the Supreme Court ruling it was it was fantastic too, with on Crunch and whatnot. I was like, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Unfortunately, with the plaintiff side this time. Yeah. Well, I will say since you brought it up, yeah. um, this is, I'm already on the record talking about this, but I think it's very very funny. Which literally, I was in arbitration. This is a true story. This is a true story. I was about to give opening statement. I mean, literally five minutes from giving opening statement. Um, on an ATD in an ATDS oh, case, no. okay, now I arguing that a predictive dialer was not an ATDS, and I'm about to start. I'm sitting across the table, uh, and Frank Kearney uh, mm-hmm. at the time at Morgan and Morgan is going against me. He's on the other side of the table. He goes, uh, Eric, <laughs> and I'm like, Yeah, and he's like, um, You might want to take a look at this. I'm like, Dude, I'm about to, I'm about to, <laughs> I'm about to, you know, sing my song, buddy. I'm like, calm down. And he's like, No, Eric, you, I think you really need to see this. Um, and so he's very classy, right? Because he could have just let me give my opening statement and then come up and said, bam, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal just said you're wrong, dude. Uh, but he didn't. He showed it to me. So I'm sitting here reading this <laughs> Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal ruling um, right before I'm about to give this opening. And, you know, needless to say, we settled the case pretty quick after that. Uh, but it was, I mean, like, what, what are the odds? You know, it was just remarkable. But anyway, thank you for the, so you the, trip, the okay. trip down memory lane. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, so... You know, I sat there, you know, and my, my poor little head went, mm, very sad now. And then I was like, all right, well, get on it, team. Let's go. And then, of course, Pujo took it and ran. Yeah. And for team, you you folks, who are, this is way before your TCPA time, but as you heard Josh talk, you know, mm-hmm. the Marx decision essentially said that your cell phone's an ATDS, right, in the mm-hmm. Ninth Circuit. So, um, you know, we've come a long way since Marx to Facebook. So it was cool to see Josh a part of that. Yeah, September 2018 to November 2022, four years. Uh, a lot has changed. Um, okay, uh, PJ, what did you think of the guy, man? I thought he was uh, very informative. I like the guy, so definitely uh, learned a lot. Yeah, you said last time that you liked Adrian. Now, now you like Josh. He's got kind of the, like even, calm disposition. Kind you of just like, don't like it kind of soothed you a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I don't dislike Pranic either, but uh, some of them are a little bit more. I hate to use this word, but slimier than others. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Josh, so is Josh the slimy or the not, the not so slimy? On a scale of one to ten, uh, ten being the slimiest slime that ever slimed, and uh, one being like kind of dry. Six. six on the slime scale. Yeah. Wow, six that's on the slime scale. You know, I, I want a graphic right now. PJ slime scale, <laughs> right? Like we got to get this done, guys. Um, okay, yeah, so let's right. let's throw it over to you, Tori. What did you think? Well, I didn't think he was that slimy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't sound like he was interested in putting anyone in jail. So I got to give him that much at least. Uh, but it was definitely interesting to hear, you know, you two going down memory lane and seeing where it all started, so. It's crazy. This is the guy yeah. that I had my first case against. Yeah. I mean, first TCPA case. Like, I wouldn't <laughs> be in the TCPA if it was for Josh. Like, I'd still probably be a trial lawyer somewhere, you know, making a lot more money. Wait. Uh, being, <laughs> being, ha- being happy, trying cases, traveling the world. Wait a second. What am I doing? Uh, but in seriousness, it's pretty wild to think, yeah. right? If he hadn't returned my call that day, if he hadn't given me that extension, I mean... There might not be a Troutman firm. There might not be TCPA World. I mean, there definitely wouldn't be TCPAWorld.com. So mm-hmm. it's amazing the way these things work. Um, it, but it's cl- I'm glad that it's all happened the way it has, Tori. That way you're you're yeah. riding alongside. Me too. Good to have you here, Dame. <laughs> uh, okay, let's finish up with the Baroness. What do you think? I thought it was a great interview. Um, I was literally going to say what Tori said. I enjoyed <laughs> I enjoyed listening to you guys. Um, your old stories. From way back when. See, now, you have to say that because you work for me, right? <laughs> but do you really like hearing old stories? Because I feel like no, there, I do, there, there, was this, there was this old Shel Silverstein um, poem called The Battle. I don't know if you guys remember this. I was reading it to my kids not long ago. Um, and it goes something like, let me tell you 
you know, son, about the, the battles I was in, if you'd like to hear, when I was, oh, wait, you wouldn't? End of story. Oh, wow. And that's the end <laughs> of the poem, right? Um, and so I sometimes feel like when we start talking, and, you know, we might lose audience members and people are like, why are these guys reminiscing, like you old you old timers? But it's nice to hear that you actually enjoyed that. No, I did. I think especially since the TCPA is so new also and you had your first case with him, I thought that was very interesting. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much. And uh, to all of you out there, I hope that you enjoyed that. I mean, look, my takeaway is very straightforward. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Josh. I think he's a fantastic attorney. Uh, again, the fact that he's pivoting to SIPA, that tells you everything you need to know mm-hmm. about the importance of that statute. Um, the guy, he's a great guy. Uh, I just, you know, I like the guy, but at the same time, he's a plaintiff's lawyer, he, and we can't lose sight of the fact that, you know, the guy's brought a ton of cases uh, and hurt a lot of people, you know. Um, and that's the unfortunate thing is even if they're decent fellas, you know, what their line of work is is ultimately to, to hurt businesses. Um, now, you know, the way I look at my job, of course, is to help businesses make sure that you folks stay compliant, understand what the law is. Um, I know, you know, in, in a plaintiff's lawyer's mind, you know, they probably think they're doing something good too. Uh, but I know um, that most of you, all of you listening to this show, uh, and most of the folks out there that are uh, legitimate businesses want to be compliant. Uh, and so, you know, it just, it's just unfortunate that a good dude like that is on the wrong side of the, of the law. Maybe I'll get him over to the defense side one day. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, as always, folks, we really appreciate you tuning in to this, our sixth edition of the Deserve to Win podcast. Bye, everybody. We'll talk soon.